Okay, hello DevOx. Hi, everybody. Um, there's a lot of people working to get in, so if you've got a little room in there, uh, squeeze in. Thank you all very, very, very much for coming, um, spending this uh, 40 minutes to an hour uh, to talk about containers and Kubernetes. Um, so hi, I'm Brian, and um, you can get a hold of me on Twitter and Google+. And as a developer advocate, my job is to um, kind of help explain things and then hopefully enable you guys to build awesome stuff or help build awesome stuff. And then when you run into trouble uh, using, for example, Google Cloud APIs uh, because they're confusing or there's some bug, um, contact me and we'll try to bring that information back into the organization and make things better. So feedback loop job. Okay, so context setting. So uh, Google is currently thinking about compute as this kind of spectrum. So um, on one end, we have, actually I'll start over here. Uh, we've got uh, platform as a service kind of stuff. So if you're familiar with App Engine or uh, Heroku, things like that, um, you basically write code, you deploy it up to a service somewhere, and they handle running as many copies as you need uh, for the traffic you're actually getting. On the other side, we have virtual machines hosted on the internet. So you uh, call up, you say, I want a computer that's this big, with this many uh, processors, this much RAM, that sort of thing. Um, and you get a raw computer, you install an OS, um, maybe it comes installed, Linux or Windows, and install all of your software on top of that. So you can do anything you want over there. Uh, usually there's some constraints over here that allow the auto-scaling. And today, we're gonna talk about this middle part, uh, the cluster like running, thinking about a whole data center as if it's one computer. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, and I'm gonna refer back to this phrase over and over. It's not really the perfect phrase, but when we're trying to think of a whole cluster of computers all as if they're one computer, like a data center as one computer, we need a distributed process manager. Um, we need to be able to think about a system D or an upstart-like thing, um, but that runs across a whole fleet of machines. So we'll keep that echoing back across. Um, I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about uh, what I think is a very common architecture, and then move on to Docker containers, how they change things in that world, and then on to Kubernetes, and how that changes things even further. And then we'll wrap up. So here we are. Okay, so I don't know if you've read the highscalability.com blog. Um, if you haven't, I highly recommend taking a look. Um, they regularly do write-ups of common architectures for websites that get very, very large. And kind of, even if you're doing mobile, everything's a website these days because you've probably got an API behind the scenes uh, as well. So if you kind of uh, extract the key points out of all of these articles, there's almost always uh, kind of front-end web servers of some sort. There's a database, which eventually becomes a bottleneck, probably. And then you've got a caching layer to help take some of that pressure off. Um, and you probably have some batch processing. And then you can make this as complex as you want from there. Uh, add more different kinds of batch processing, different versions of things, uh, independent web servers, the whole bit. So we're gonna kind of keep this uh, in context as we're kind of working through some of the Docker conversations. Um, but I think it's very common that we deploy these things each on their own machine. So, the web servers might get their own machines, and maybe those machines are all the same, um, hopefully. Um, but they're each on one machine. Um, the caching, maybe that's on a different machine. The database, we definitely keep that in its own world so that uh, nothing affects that, right? Uh, you've got back-end job processes and things like that. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this, but it's basically just easier and less risk, I think, is one of the primary drivers. Um, in terms of managing these things, um, I've definitely done the world where you just manually set everything up and you have all your special snowflake servers and don't touch that one, it's delicate. Um, hopefully these days you're using something like Chef or Puppet, uh, Salt, Ansible, one of these management systems that will kind of set up your environment for you and get things good to go. Uh, but that's you know, definitely a lot of work. As far as the machines go, like uh, we do development on all the computers, right? We're on our laptops, on computers that we own or our companies own, um, deploying things to the cloud, everywhere. But again, probably each different service to one machine. And even if you have uh, your whole application automated, um, deployed everywhere, 
it's, it's a huge challenge to kind of uh, get this right and get it going that far. And then there's a whole bunch of things that, uh, that I think are kind of lurking out here. Um, part of the reason we keep things on separate machines is not just uh, conflict on usage, but conflict of dependencies, right? Um, apologize here. I come from kind of the, the Python world. And in the, in the Python world, dependency management has been an ongoing challenge. We kind of reinvent it every three or four years. Um, and so you're constantly struggling with, oh yeah, I need this, this library, and I want to make sure the context is all right, and not a different version of it, or what have you. Um, and then because we're keeping things so separate, utilization is a challenge, right? So you scale your host machines up big enough that they can handle your peak load, and they're quiet, like, almost all the time. Um, and then when it comes to scaling, you've got a bunch of manual steps to do things like that. Uh, deploying new versions of things is challenging. You know, if you have to roll back, I don't even know. Um, and out of curiosity, how many people in this room have a test environment that looks like your production environment? Ooh, there is a lot of work represented by those hands. Um, that's, that's a pretty high percent. I think that was like something like roughly a third. Uh, super impressed. Um, and I will submit, so uh, check me on this by the end of the talk, but I'll submit that we can dramatically improve uh, the situation managing all of these challenges uh, using containers and Kubernetes. Okay, so containers. So first off, um, how many people here have heard of Docker, right? Everybody, hopefully. Um, and how many people have actually started a container? Oh, nice. Okay, so probably about half the room. Um, even there, I, I think um, this is early days in kind of figuring out how all these pieces go together. And so um, I know I'm kind of a little confused about how things adapt all the time, and there's a lot of different options for how to work through all of these. Um, it's a great time to be working with this, though. Um, I think they're going to dramatically simplify all of our development lives. Um, so I'm going to throw out just a few um, different ways to think about containers, or maybe if you're already totally down with containers and like know exactly what they are, different ways to try to help explain that to other people in your organization. Um, so if you come from like a background where you've you worked with Solaris zones or uh, jails on Linux, I think you can roughly say these are kind of like super powered versions of, of you know, Linux jails, things like that. Um, another way that you can talk about this, and this works especially well in kind of a business concept context or a, a high level architectural context, is every time somebody says Docker or container or Kubernetes, just say microservices. Just be done with it, microservices. It's not completely right, um, but it's really close in, a, in, a, in terms of a lot of the benefits where things are going out. Um, and my favorite is that these are just processes. We're all used to running processes on our computers and um, these are just processes, but they're magic processes where the context and the environment goes with the process. So it sees the same execution environment wherever it runs. So just a little context, Google loves containers, completely loves, loves, loves containers. Um, we uh, submitted the early control groups uh, stuff to the Linux kernel. We're actively uh, participating in the development of the live container abstraction around manage these, these things, and I won't talk about it today, but uh, the new versions of App Engine can all run Docker containers, so you can run any language you like um, there. And Kubernetes is all in on containers. Um, this, um, yeah, I'll skip to that for later. And um, you may have heard in, in other Google Talks, we run almost everything in a container in production at Google. So we start something like two billion containers a week. Um, it's like a big number, right? But we start like two billion processes a week. But they're all in containers. Um, and I want to kind of like highlight a few things you get out of this. You get uh, process isolation. So between the control groups and the, uh, the namespacing, it's as if every process sees that it's got a, the computer all to itself. So it thinks it has its own kernel, it thinks it has its own file system, it thinks it, it uh, can do whatever it wants, it can spin 100% proc and go crazy. Um, but in actuality, it's kind of actually constrained down by these control groups, and it is allowed a specific amount of processor and a specific amount of network I.O., and can't go beyond that. And you can also set relative priorities between these things. Um, so that's really powerful, and it dramatically reduces the risk of putting processes that might compete onto the same hosts. Um, so process isolation is one concept. Another one, all throughout, is 
you can kind of imagine these as like static binaries. Um, do you remember static binaries? Like you, you write an app in C and you compile it, and then you just give the executable to somebody and it runs. You're just kind of done. Okay, well maybe all of your memories aren't so, all of you don't have such fond memories of static binaries. Um, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a great space to be, right? Where you can just you know, send this uh, process, potential process, out to people and it will just run. So static binaries also come with some big challenges, right? When you need to update the security libraries that they're using or, or what have you, in case there's some sort of bug, which never happens, right? I'm a little bit sarcastic, so if that comes out. Um, so in a way, you can think of containers giving you the best of both worlds of kind of static binaries, because you get this um, encapsulated runtime environment so that it runs the same way everywhere. Um, and this is because of the file system work that Docker does, uh, where it creates a file system out of layers of changes to the actual file system. And when it starts the container, that's the only thing the process sees. And any changes it makes are added to a new layer. Um, so it always sees the same starting point, and it always sees the same context wherever it runs. And so this gives you kind of the you know, benefit of like super-powered static binaries. And then if you do have, you know, if one of your dependencies has an emergency fix, um, you're building these with a recipe, usually a Docker file. And so you can actually just go in and change the base image so that you're using the newest version, recreate re your actual uh, container image, your image, and then as long as you have a good way of pushing these out into production, you can just go um, and just replace it. You just stop the one and start the new one, and you're good to go. Um, so best of both worlds, maybe. So awesome. Let's do containers everywhere, right? We'll just um, containerize everything. We'll run containers on all of our computers. Everything will live in a container. It'll be fantastic, right? Maybe a little hard. I hear some maybe not quite, but either. Um, so we might run into some trouble with, like, how do we tell the containers where the other ones are, right? Like, our network uh, starts to get really complex. How do they find each other? Um, how do we keep them running? How do we keep a catalog of even what we have uh, if we start creating thousands of containers across our machines? Um, so we need a mechanism for handling that. And um, I'm going to come back to this distributed processor. It's like not a uh, distributed process manager. It's not quite the perfect word, but we'll go with it. Um, and so this is exactly uh, where we come to Kubernetes. And so Kubernetes is an open source project uh, that comes out of Google, um, just released in, I believe, March of this year, or April. Uh, so it's very, very new, and it's moving very, very quickly. Um, it's up on GitHub. It's like all the development happens out in the open. Uh, as an aside, if you've ever been curious like, what a code review looks like at Google, like, you can just go and look at the pull requests and uh, see real work going on. And um, it's already become incredibly popular, and we're really, really excited about that. Um, we've got um, lots of individual developers, lots of other companies working on this. And this project comes out of the 10 years of experience Google has developing container-based workloads um, and running, keeping them going uh, over time. So. This is a little quick update, just to say, you know, just um, things that have happened in the last, you know, week or so, uh, a couple weeks. A new uh, version released. We were up to 116 different contributors. If everybody in this room like uh, jumps in and files an issue or like gives it a try, then we'll be like way over that. So, um, and uh, GitHub stars. And one of the things we're really, really excited about is that not only are uh, individual developers like diving in and playing with this, but also some very large organizations with lots of, lots of experience building distributed systems. So uh, we've got some Google engineer experience baked in. We've got folks from CoreOS, HP, IBM, Mesos is, Sphere is implementing an, uh, an API for Mesos that's uh, Kubernetes compliant, or not compliant, it's the same API, it's the standard API. Uh, Microsoft already is doing stuff, Red Hat is doing all kinds of stuff, um, Salt Stack, VMware, lots of others. Um, and it's, very, very, it's under very, very active development. You know, we've got um, better scheduling and even better scheduling coming. Um, service model is changing a little bit, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, some more logging and monitoring built in. And you know it's a new project when like, binary releases are like a new feature. So we really think that um, when you move from thinking about containers running on one machine to running them across a whole fleet of machines, 
you need some uh, extra abstractions to help keep that simple. Um, otherwise, you get a kind of a complexity explosion if you just try to think about it um, kind of the same way. And, and the core idea here, I think, is the difference between kind of imperative and declarative. So, um, you know, with uh, most systems, you come along and you say, okay, I want to run like five of these and like go run five. And then they come up and they run and, and all is good until, you know, like you're off having dinner and or asleep or something and then one of them crashes and the next one crashes. And then you have to go back and overrun two more um, on your phone or what have you. Um, and Kubernetes kind of takes the inverse of that. Like you define, I want to be running five always. And it'll be like, oh, we start five of those up. And if one of them crashes, it'll be like, oh, that's not healthy anymore. Let's start a new one up because it's constantly running a reconciliation between the declared state that you give and the actual state of the world. And it's always trying to make the world look like you've wanted it to be. So uh, there's a few concepts that I'm going to run through to help uh, keep things simple and easy to reason about as you start getting into having thousands and thousands of containers. Um, but first, pardon me. Not what you needed to hear. OK, so pods. Um, pods are one or more containers that kind of have a life cycle together. So very often, this is just one container. It might be a web front end or something like that. But you might need to run some kind of maintenance containers next to things, and they need to always run on the same uh, machine. Or they need to do some work that is tightly related to each other. You've got a group of processes. So you can make individual containers and then wrap them up in this concept called a pod. And pods are the unit of scheduling in Kubernetes. And so they're just a group of containers. You make a template for these. Say, OK, I want it based on this image. We'll see one in a moment. Um, and it goes. Next up, we have labels. And labels are just key value pairs. But they're, it's a concept kind of baked through the whole API. So when you create a pod, you can set arbitrary labels on it. And it's also how you query the system to say how many of these are running. Um, you can ask questions like, give me the list of all the pods that are front ends in production. Or give me the list of all the pods that are running Redis in test. Things like that. Um, or whatever values you decide to set when you create them. And then based upon these labels, um, in terms of how the reconciliation actually works, uh, we have this concept called replication controllers. And so when you push a template out to a replication controller, say, I want to run three copies of this pod. And Kubernetes will just pick a spot where there's space and run those. Um, and then it will constantly run this reconciliation uh, against the, the replication controller's template and the current state of things. And that's how it ends up working. And those are connected via, via labels. OK, so that's a lot of talking. 